it's been a while since we last met virtually. I hope you guys had uh, some good time during the Labor Day weekend. So today, <clears throat> we are going to uh, look at uh, functions. Functions are very important and the fundamental objects in mathematics. So what is a function? Um, I don't know if you guys are fascinated with machines. I was when I was a kid at your age. So you can regard a mathematical function as a machine, okay? as shown in this diagram here. So this machine, uh, we know many machines work uh, in a way that uh, takes some raw material as input and uh, makes uh, products as output, right? So a mathematical function is very similar. You can regard it as a number machine. So as shown in this picture here, right? So this is my machine, okay? It's a mathematical function. So do you see in and out, right? So this machine takes numbers as input and then work on those numbers according to some rules, right? And to produce numbers as outputs, okay? So in this particular example here, right? So the rule here is multiply by two and then add a three, okay? So if you have provided X as an input to this machine, okay? Remember X is just a variable that represents numbers, right? So X, you can consider X is just some number, okay? So this number now is multiplied by two, then add three, you get a new number, right? Of course, we know the expression for this rule would be two times this X plus three, right? So that's the expression representing this rule. So then the output would be that number, which is what? Equal, 2x plus 3, okay? So that's what a function does, okay? It's a machine, takes numbers as input and produce numbers as output, okay? So how to do so? You have rules or expressions to, to, to do so, okay? So now, very quickly, we can look at some uh, uh, material as the input and the, what's the corresponding output for this particular example here, right? Say if the input x is equal to negative one, according to this rule, right? Negative one plug in into this uh, machine, right? So uh, the negative one will be multiplied by two. So two times x, x is equal to negative one, then add a three. So negative two plus three, the output I denote as y here, so y would be equal one. So x equal negative one input, y output positive one, right? Similarly, if x is zero as the input, then two times zero plus three, okay, output three. So if x is equal one, so it's one times two plus three, the output is five, right? See, you see that kind of uh, correspondence between input and output. And uh, that kind of correspondence can be written as a pairs of numbers, right? So the first pair you hear, you have here is next one and one. The second pair is zero and three, right? The third pair is one and five, right? So the left uh, entry is the input, the right entry is the output. So that's what a function does here, okay? So this is the definition. What is a function? A function is a correspondence, or sometimes we say a relation or mapping 
that assigns one output to each input according to a rule, right? Clearly, in this case, this rule actually is written as what? As an algebraic expression, right? So if you use x as a variable for input, right, then the rule is given by this uh, algebraic expression, two times x plus three in that above example, right? So that's the rule to produce the output. And we can give this machine a name, so we call this machine f. So that's the name of this function, and we denote this function as f of x. Okay, so x is the input, f is my machine, so the output would be f of this x, is the rule applied to this x, which is 2x plus 3. And sometimes we call this x as the independent variable, right, and y equal 2x plus 3, so y, the output, as the dependent variable, okay, y equal to x plus 3. So that's the notation for a function, okay? Now, regarding this definition here, I want to point out one thing, right? So if you read again, so a correspondence that assigns one output to each input. So I box this keyword one here, okay? Not two, not three. You just assign one output to each input. Meaning, if you give me a material, I produce just one product for you, okay? So exactly one output corresponds to each input. So that's my first note, okay? So for example, say I have this relation here, relation absolute value of y is equal to x, right? So x and the y are related by this equation, right? This relation. Well, x is regarded as the input and the y is regarded as output. And it turns out that this kind of relation is not a function by definition. Why? As you can see, right? So say if x, this input is equal one, so then you have absolute value of y is equal one, then we know y can be what? So y can be positive one, and the negative one. So for this relation, there are two other puts corresponding or say assigned to this one input here. So by definition, this is not a function. Clear? So very important, okay? However, different inputs may lead to the same output. This is totally fine for a function, okay? So let's look at this relation. So y equals to the absolute value of x. So in this relation here, the absolute value sign is on this input, not on this output, unlike the first case, okay? Now, this relation is a function, okay, because whatever value you assign to x, then you have only one value for y, right? So one output for each x value. However, if you, if the value of x is one and the next one, the y value is the same, is one, right? So this is totally fine as long as this one here does not give two different outputs, okay? So you may have, different inputs, okay, produce the same output. That does not violate the definition, right? So still you can see just one arrow coming out from one, what? From one input, right? This one is a function, okay? This relation is a function. And sometimes, okay, later on, so in the next class, we'll, we'll look at this case more closely. So if, okay, if any two different inputs lead to two different outputs, then we say the function is one to one. So one particular input, you get one particular output. One particular output 
corresponds to one particular input. So it's one to one correspondence. Unlike the second example here, you see two numbers correspond to same what? Output, right? That's not a one to one. So this is one to one. The one assigns to what? Next one assigns to next one. So this function here, y equal x, is a one to one function, okay? Different x, different y, different y, different x. So that's the definition. I hope it is clear to you, right? So again, right? A machine assigns one output to each input according to a rule. A rule actually in our case is just a, an algebraic expression, right? Working on that input, okay? So to see if you understand this definition, so let me launch this uh, poll question here, all right? I'll give you uh, 30 seconds, okay? It should be quite easy. Which relation below is not a function? Okay, so clearly uh, the third one, C, is not a function. So the relation in this diagram is not a function. Why? As you can see, you see two arrows coming out from the input three, right? So there are two outputs assigned to this particular one input. So this relation is not a function, okay? Uh, others, A and B are functions, right? Say B actually is a one-to-one -one function, clearly, right? One-to-one. -one. And the A, you see uh, these two inputs, right? Lead to the same output negative four, but that's okay, right? You don't have two outputs for any input. So still, this relation is a function, okay? Clear? Okay, so we are all clear about the definition. Now, so it's a machine, right? So if I use this machine, right? This machine takes uh, material, right? To produce products, right? So you have a storage for the material, the raw material. So that uh, storage place is called uh, the domain of this function, okay? So in this case, so the set or say the collection of all the inputs, all these numbers, right, can be used as the inputs to this function form this family, right? So it's called the domain of this function. So the domain of this function is the collection or say the set of inputs to this machine f of x, okay? So normally we use this capital letter D to denote this family, okay? It's a family name, okay? So it's a, a set. And if, a variable, uh, if a number, say this number x, is inside this uh, uh, family, right, inside this uh, storage room for the raw material, then we say x is in D. So we have this uh, uh, symbol, this mathematical symbol to denote is in, say belongs to, okay, so we say x belongs to D, okay? So for each input, right, from this domain, then this machine produces what? an output, right? One output, we just learned that, right? For each input machine produces one output. So then of course, so, so all these inputs, right? Will pass or will be supplied to this machine. So the machine will make all these outputs. So all these outputs form a family, right? Form a collection. So that family is called the range of this function. And normally we use this first letter R to denote this family, this set. So it's a set of outputs from this function, from this machine F of X, clear? So this picture here is a, uh, gives you this definition here, right? So of this function, so domain, your X takes X comes from the domain and then 
machine works on X, produce the output Y, and the Y is put into what? Put into the range, okay? So for example, so sometimes a function is given to you with the rule, so, and uh, the domain. So this is the case in this example here, right? I give, I, I give you this function, f of x, so that's my rule, right? It's uh, given by what? Next two times the input x, then add three. Then this is the output, right? Y is equal to this, right? So I tell you x is between negative one and two, including negative one, right? So this is uh, the specified domain of this particular function here, okay? I tell you, oh, your x takes real values in this interval here, okay? So we can say the specified domain of this function d is equal to this interval, okay? So I want to tell you how to um, write down a domain of a function in terms of intervals. So this is called the interval. So this is equivalent to say the input x is between negative one, including negative one, and the two, but not including two. So you have, you see this uh, square bracket to include this value and this round the parentheses to exclude this value here. And uh, so the inputs are between these two values, separated by this comma here. So this is a, a notation for an interval, okay? So if you look at this interval on the real number line, you clearly you can see here, right? This is the real number line. So next one is right here and the positive two is right here. Now we know what? the domain of this function would be all the real numbers between negative one and the two, right? In this uh, region here, right? In this interval, we see now we see this is the interval, right? Including negative one, so we use the solid dots for negative one, excluding uh, positive two, so we use this uh, open circle, right? To, ex to exclude this uh, positive two, right? We saw this before when we uh, solved the inequalities, remember that? Okay, so this is a way to uh, specify the domain of a function. We can use uh, either these inequalities, okay, these inequalities, or we can just uh, specify the domain as this interval, okay, which are equivalent to the inequalities, okay? Now, if I ask you, what's the range of this function? So, okay, so my x, so I can, use any x value between next one and two, so what kind of output I can get? So what's the range for, for the output, okay? So we can do so, we know the output is computed as a negative two times x plus three, right? So that's the expression for the output. And in our case, we know x is between next one and two. So we want to figure out if x is between next one and two, what's the range for negative two x plus three, right? So very easy for this problem here, you just multiply this x by negative two, then add a three and see what kind of uh, inequalities I can get, right? So if I do so, so x multiplied by negative two, of course, be careful because you are multiplying inequalities by negative number, you will need to reverse what? reverse the direction of your inequalities, right? So you have two great, two or equal to negative two x, that is greater than negative four, okay? Then you add, so of course, if you want, you can rewrite this as negative two x between negative four and the positive two, right? Just, just put the smallest number at the left-hand side and the largest number at the right-hand side, like in this manner, okay? So then you add three on both sides, right? Okay, so you get a negative one and a five. So what's the range of this function? Oh, it's between, so the output is a, every real number between negative one and five, including five, excluding negative one. Okay, so that's the way you can work on the domain and uh, the range of a function, okay? So sometimes you see a function but the domain of the function is not specified. If the domain of the function, say y is equal to f of x, so y is the output, x is the input, right? So the output is made from this f on x, right? On this rule on x. If the domain is not specified, so what kind of values of x I can use, right? Then we say the implied domain of the function of f is what? 
is the set of all allowed inputs. So at what, 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 whatever inputs can be uh, supply can be uh, can be can be uh, passed through this function, then we say uh, they form the domain of this function. Okay. So for example, say this function f x equal one over x, right? I is a real function, so it takes in real values as inputs and uh, spits out real values as outputs. Okay, so it's called a real function. And uh, if I ask you, what's the domain of this function? So because I didn't specify the domain, so then the domain would be all the real values that can be allowed by this uh, rule. Right? This rule can work on, on all these values. So clearly you see, oh, it's one divided by x. So one can divide by any real numbers except what? Of course, we know, except uh, zero, right? Except zero. So the domain of this function would be all the real values except zero. That's um, the way to tell this domain using uh, words. But uh, if I want to use uh, intervals, you can say, okay, on the real number line, so you say you can take any values except zero. So zero is excluded, right? It's is it is excluded, so so you can uh, supply any input from zero to the left and any input from zero to the right all the way right and to, to the left all the way to what to the negative infinity because you can go to the left forever right similarly you can go to the right forever right so you have so you, you say x can approach the post infinity so then you can write down the domain of this function in this particular manner you say okay. It goes from negative infinity, right, from that negative infinity, from the far left, right, all the way to zero, right, see? Negative infinity to zero, right? We use a parenthesis, round parenthesis uh, um, behind zero here, right, meaning zero is, is, is excluded, okay? And uh, or, or x can be what? Can be from zero to positive infinity. So we have another interval here from zero to positive infinity. So X can be either in this interval or in that interval. So these two intervals are joined, right, by this uh, keyword or here. Sometimes we say, we use this notation here, this U here, means the union of these two intervals, okay? So we can write down the domain D is equal this interval or that interval, right, union, okay? So we have this union notation, clear? So to give a try, so what is the domain of the following function? So this is the proof question, okay? So you can give this problem a try. One minute. Okay, so most of you have chosen um, a second answer. So one, not included, two included, okay, from one to two. That's the correct answer. So, so let's work on this problem here. So, this function, the rule here is the summation of these two expressions, so that's so two terms. So the first term is the square root of something, which is two minus x. We know square root, we are talking about the real functions. So square root of this number, this number must be what? 
must be the square of something, right? So this number must be non-negative, right? So two minus x is the square of a real number. We know square of a real number is non-negative, great or equal to zero. So from this term, okay, so the square root of two minus x, this term we know to make this uh, valid, we require two minus x should be great or equal to zero, non-negative. And uh, similarly, square root of x minus one, right? So x minus one must also be non-negative. However, square root of negative, uh, square root of x minus one is on the denominator. So this guy cannot be zero. Otherwise you divide by zero. So this term, one over square root of x minus one requires x minus one must be a positive number, cannot be zero, right? So in the first case, we know x must be what? Must be less or equal to two, right? If you move x to the right hand side, x less or equal to two. So for the second term, we know x must be great or equal, uh, greater than one, not equal to one. Because if when x equals to one, you get a zero, you divide by zero. So my function f x is the sum of two terms. So you must make sure this x as the input, make sure this whole rule works, right? So, so you can write it down, okay, so x is less or equal to two, right? x less or equal to two. So you can write it down as what? As this, as a, an interval. So it would be from negative infinity to positive two. For x greater than one, you can write down this as an interval would be from one, not including one, to what? To post infinity. In this situation here, we require what? We require x is less or equal to two and x is greater than one, right? We need to make both terms, you need to make sure both terms are happy, okay? Can, 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 can work. So now we have this keyword here, and, okay, and. So mathematically, you can use this notation here, it's called the intersection. So we're talking about the intersection of these two, two intervals, okay? So if you draw a number line here, okay? So the first interval from positive two, so this is the positive two included, right, all the way to neck infinity, right? So that's the, First interval. The second interval is from one, not including one, to what? To cost infinity. And uh, we want to look at the intersection of these two intervals. So it's in this region here, right? In this region here. So mathematically, we can write down this uh, as, uh, I just want to introduce this notation here. Of course, this is obvious for you, right? Of course, x is greater than one and less or equal to two, right? So together, we know x is uh, uh, great, greater than one, less or equal to two, right? So we can write down this manner. But I just wanted to show you this note, mathematical notation, this uh, in the second notation, you can write down this as what? As a neck infinity to two, this interval intersection with uh, this interval from one to infinity. Of course, this can be written simply as what? From one to two, right? From one to two, right? Like this equivalent. Okay, so later on, when you see this notation here, this notation here, it means end, it means intersection, okay? Unlike, unlike this situation here, okay? It's called a union, it's O. So X can be here or there, right? But here, X must be in both, right? Must be in both, in both intervals. So that means you are talking about the common region, okay, of these two intervals. Is that clear? Okay, so let's move on. So I think at this point, we are very clear about uh, the definition of uh, a function, right? And we know what a function is, and we know what is the domain and the range of a function, right? What are the domain and the range of a function? So then you may ask, right, why we want to introduce uh, such uh, objects, right, in mathematics uh, called functions. And I already mentioned that at the very beginning, I say, functions are fundamental 
objects, or say very important objects in mathematics, right? So later on you will study functions, right, in, 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 in many different courses, okay? So why do we need a function? And as we already know from the definition, we say the function actually is somehow you can regard a function as a relation between two quantities, right? So one quantity is the input is x, another quantity is y. So then this function establishes establish the relation between x and y. That's very helpful in real applications. You can use functions to what? To describe relations, okay? So it's like a modeling, right? You can model a lot of real world problems, okay, or phenomena by functions, okay? For example, say when you do weather forecast, uh, the temperature can be regarded, so the temperature in, 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 in Dallas, right, can be regarded as a function of time. So if you know that a function, that means you can what? You can predict the weather at a whatever time, right? So, so it's very important, right? We, 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 we study functions, okay? So to, to give a taste, right? So this is a very simple modeling problem. Say the area A, right? I use this symbol A to denote the area. So the area A of a circle with the radius R is a function of R, right? So you have a relation between the area and the radius and everybody knows that A is equal a function of R. And well, this function F of R, this rule is what? pi times the square of r, right? We know that's the rule, right? So it's pi times r square, you get the area, right? So now if you know, oh, r is equal one, so what's the area? Pi r one square. r equal two, what's the area? Pi two square, right? So you can easily find the area using this function here, right? So to give an example, right? So let's work on this pole problem here. If a rope of the length 10 is to form a rectangle with one side length x. Can you write down the area y of this rectangle as a function of x? Okay. So I'll give you one minute, okay, to work on this problem. Area of y of the rectangle. The function of x. Okay, let's take a look, okay. I think this time um, the answers are all over the place. So let's take a look, okay. So, So you are given a rope. So say this is a rope, right? And we know the length of this rope is what? Is 10, maybe 10 meters or 10 feet or whatever, okay? So 10, so we don't care about the units just right now, 10. So I'm going to use this rope to what? To form a rectangle, right? So you just uh, bend this rope, right? A bend and a bend and a bend and a bend and then join the two ends, right, right here, right, you form what? You form a rectangle, like that. 
okay? And we know the problem tells us, right, to write down the area of this rectangle. So the area is uh, denoted as by y of this, okay? The area of this rectangle as a function of one side length, x. Suppose this side here is x, okay? So this is the one side of this, uh, of this rectangle here. So you want to find the relation between the area and the side length x, right? So that relation is a mathematical function, okay? So how to do so? And what you are given here, right? You know the total length of this rope is 10. And we know this rope is used to enclose this rectangle. And so we know the perimeter of this rectangle is what? So the perimeter of this rectangle is equal what? Is equal 10, right? So it's the length of this plus the length of this plus the length of that plus the length of that, right? So if this side length is x, then we know the opposite side is also x, right? So what's the side of this? What's the length of these two sides? Right? Same thing, right? So now we know, okay, so 10 is equal what? Is equal x plus x plus uh, two times this, uh, this, right? You have two of this, right? So two times this side length, I call it d here, right? If I want. So what is d? So d is equal five minus x. Of course, that's obvious, right? Because you, need, you know, this half of this rope here is what? Is five. So this is x, of course, this should be five minus x, right? That's another way to think about it, right? So now if you know these two sides, right? Five minus x and x, so we know the area is just a simple matter, right? So we know what? And we know y is equal x, this side times that side, five minus x. So if you dispute, you get a five x minus x squared. So that's my function, okay? So area as a function of the side length x. So what's the domain of this function? This is a real world problem, right? It's an application problem, right? So we know the length, the x is the side length. So length cannot be what? Cannot be zero or negative. So x should be what? Should be greater than zero, okay? So that's from the physics of the problem. That's the restriction, okay? But also we know so the total, so the five, so the x plus another side is what? Is equal five. So if I want to make this sure, this d, this side here, right? This guy, that's another side. This guy should also be what? Should be positive, right? Should be positive. So five minus x should be positive too, right? This is the, the, the other side. So that means x is what? X is less than five. So together, you know what? So x should be between zero and five. So that's the domain of this uh, function here, okay? So this just give you a taste of uh, the usefulness of uh, functions, okay? So we do need the functions, okay, in to model real world problems, okay? You have to do some similar homework problems like that, okay? To try to establish the function. Okay, now, so we know what a function is, and we know a function is useful, right? So now, okay, so we'll, we'll talk about how to um, compute outputs from inputs. So that's called evaluating functions. And also sometimes you may have an equation, right? Relating function, uh, 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 a function satisfies, and then we want to try to find out that function. So it's called a solving function equations, okay? So, so that's the next topic here. So these two topics are related as you will see, okay? So evaluation, eva evaluating a function is very simple, right? Because if you know that rule, you just apply that rule to the input, right? So again, take this very simple example as, a, as a, my a starting point here. So consider fx equals to 2x plus three, right? So this machine, okay, fx is a, 2x plus 3. So x is the input, then y would be the output, which is computed as 2 times x plus 3. So if x is equal 1, so y is equal 2 times 1 plus 3, right? So if you want, you can compute, right? Well, you know, that's a simple matter here, right? So you can compute, oh, this would be equal what? So equal 5. 
right? So if x equal two, then two times two, right? Because x now is equal two, you replace this x by two. So two plus times two plus three, so you get a seven. Okay, now how about if x is a three plus four? Now my x is a, an expression. This is called a numerical expression, of course, right? So three plus four. This is just a number at the end. If you compute it, it's just a number. But I, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a compute it. I just leave it alone. I just leave three plus four alone. So what is y if my x input is three plus four? So all you need to do is what? Replace that x. Now this x is equal what? Is it three plus four as a whole, right? So of course, don't forget to use the parentheses when you want to um, when you want to uh, 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 use a whole of something, right? So parentheses three plus four. And clearly we know it's just seven, right? It's two times seven. But I, 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 I wrote down this way, so I have a purpose here, as you will see, okay? So if you want it, then you can compute, right? Oh, three plus four, seven, two times seven, 14, so it's 17, right? You can do that, okay? So what you noticed here is this x, this variable, right? This x is a, is a variable to represent the input. So this x here is a variable represented by sometimes called an independent variable. Basically, it's just a placeholder. We can use a theta, you can use a t. I can either use just the, for, 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 for my uh, purpose here, I can just use an a, 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 a empty circle or maybe an empty box to denote that, okay? To denote that, uh, that input, okay? So f of x is equal to two times x plus three. So whatever, as long as at the end of the day, this x is just a number. So you, you, can, you can say, oh, f of this uh, box here is two times that box, or say two times this circle plus three, okay? You can put whatever number here, right? So this can be a number or can be an expression. And we know an expression at the end of the day, if you evaluate it, it's just a number, but it's just a number in disguise, right? So, so you can now you can plug in, so you treat this x just as a placeholder. It's just this place here will be multiplied by two at a three, okay? So now if I say, what is f of x squared plus x minus one? Now my input here is this whole messy expression, x squared plus x minus one. I put it in this red box, but we know for any value of x, what's inside this box is just number, right? Of course, this number can be used as an input to this machine. So f works on this number, which is x squared plus x minus one. So what's the output? You multiply this, whatever that number is, which is x squared plus x minus one by two, then you add three. You see that? So the independent variable that x is just a placeholder, okay? So you can substitute this x by a number, of course, or an expression. Okay, later on, we can even substitute a function over there, as you will see, okay, it's called a composite function. We'll get to that shortly, okay? So you get a something like this, right? So very simple. So now, and vice versa, so in this case, we know f of x squared plus x minus one is equal to what? Two times x squared plus x minus one plus three. Suppose, I give you this information here. I say, oh, f of this whole thing is equal to two times this whole thing plus three. If I ask you, what is f of x? Right, so this is the reverse of this process now. So what you need to do is, oh, when you put this whole thing as the input, what this function does is what? Multiply this whole thing by two and add three. So this whole thing here is just number. So if this number is x, then it's just what? f x would be two times that uh, number x, right? Now this guy whole thing is just like x plus three. Does that make sense to you? So in this case, I'm solving a function equation. This equation is called a function equation. So you can use this equation, you can somehow to find uh, the expression for f of x, okay? We are given f of this, uh, this messy stuff, this expression, but you can find f of x. Okay, and I can make this problem a little, a little harder if I want, right? I can say, okay, so this f of this guy, so for example, I can change this to f of x squared plus x minus one is equal to x squared plus two x 
then you, you I just simplify this expression here. So the minor two plus is plus one. So I give you something like this. I ask you, what is the f of x? You can do what? You can do this uh, algebraic manipulation. You can rewrite this whole thing in terms of this manner here. Then you find out my fx is equal to this. Right? Make sense to you? So to give this a try, can you work out this pole problem here? So f of x squared, okay, be careful, this is f of this x squared is equal to two times x power four plus three. Can you solve this function equation and find f of x? Okay, let me launch this pole question here. I think it should be straightforward. 30 seconds. Let me give you one minute, okay? I want to see more responses. Okay. I think most of you got it right, right? So it's 2x squared plus 3. So how to do this problem here? So one way you can do this problem would be, we know if you consider this x squared as a whole, so you say, okay, this is just a number, right? x squared is just a number. So if I supply this as an input, so what's the output? The output will work on this x squared. So how does the machine work on this x squared? So you want to see x squared, right? So you would rewrite this as, a, so x power four, you can write down this as x square power two or x square times x square, either way, right? So then you say, oh, if x square, well, let me finish this, right, plus three. So if x square is a main input, the machine will square of this guy, then multiply by, uh, by two and then add three, right? So what is f of x? So if you have x as the input, then would it be what? Two times the square of this x, right? So you have to treat this whole circle as x, right? So it's a two x square plus three, right? So that's one way. Just manipulate your uh, right hand side to to write down the right hand side in terms of this x square. Okay, so that's method one. Or if you want, you can just say, okay. I want to find the f of x, right? But here is not the f, it's x squared. So that's a core, so let's that, do the substitution here. So I'm going to say, I'm going to let this whole x squared as something called, a, say, z, okay? So that is z equal x squared. Then this becomes the f of z. Later on, you just replace that z. So if you can find out expression in terms of z for f z, later on, you just replace z by x. You just place a holder, right? Then you get f x. So let's do this way. So if z is x squared, but my, so there you have what? You have f of z is equal to x power four plus three. I want to write this right hand side in terms of z, but now it's in x. That's not a big deal because we know x and z is related here. So if z is x squared, then we know x is equal what? Is a square root of, of z, positive or negative, right? So you can, you can, you can do, do so, right? So x is equal positive or negative of square root of z. Make sense to you? So if uh, that's the case, then you can substitute here. So this guy would be equal, now you can replace x in terms of z. So it's a two times a positive negative square root of z power four plus three. And if you do so, of course, this gives you two z squared plus three, right? Then you say, oh, f z is two z squared plus three. Of course, f x is equal to x squared plus three, right? I just use a different symbol for that. Clear? So that's the way you can solve this kind of a simple uh, function equations, okay? I will have some more challenging problems later. 
So if you understand that x independent variable in the expression of fx is just a placeholder, then you can understand the composite functions very easily. Okay. So we know so f can be regarded as a machine, right? So it takes x as the raw material, produces this product with the f of x. Since this product fx is just number, so it's a number. If it's a number, it can be used as an input to another machine, right? Totally fine. So you can supply this uh, product fx, this number, to another machine g. Then you get a g of what? Of that number. That number is f of x. So you get a g of f of x. So this is a, like a composite function. So this fx here, as you can clearly say, fx here is just my what? It's my intermediate product, right? So you want to produce the final product is g of that, of that guy, right? So the x, fx, then g of letter fx. So this is called the composition of g and f. Sometimes people use this notation here. g composite of f is g of f of x. Keep in mind, f of x is just a, a number. So it's just a supply this number to g. And this number is what? Is a product of f, right? You give x to f, then you produce this f of x, okay? So for example, Say if fx is a 2x plus 3, gx is x squared. So what is g of fx? Okay, oh, you know, oh, g is x squared. So g is x squared. If you give me f, then it's f squared, right? Remember, placeholder. You just replace this x by that or whatever that circle is, right? So it's f of x. Then what is fx or f of x? You give me x, what is f? Of course, it's 2x plus 3. So the answer of is, 2x plus 3 together, then square. So that is g of f of x. Okay? Now, similarly, you can, comp comp you can composite f and g, right? So you can pass a value x to g to this machine, produce this number, g of x, this number. Then, but, but, but you, then you provide this number to f. You get the product, final product is f of g of x, right? So this is called f composite of g, f of g of x. So so if I use these two functions, right, f 2x plus 3, g, x squared, what is f of g? Oh, f of g, so, so, is f, so f is 2 times x plus 3. So if f on g, then you just replace this x by g. So it's 2 times g, x plus 3. Place holder, right? So what is g? Oh, g is x squared. So then you substitute g, x, you get 2x squared plus 3. So very simple, okay? So you can, you can form composite functions of two functions. And uh, clearly, you can, you can do more, right? You can go beyond, right? You can, you can uh, make a, a final product using three machines, right? You can do composition of three functions, four functions, five functions. You can do these kind of things, right? Now, remember, just a number to number, right? Give a number as an input, uh, spit out a number as output, right? You can, you, can, you, can, you can make sense of all this, okay? So, um, one minute, okay, to work on this question. Then we take a break. Okay, so let me stop here. Uh, we are going to take a five minute break. So we'll resume our class at uh, 11, okay? And uh, I will explain this problem after the break.
So please leave your computer and uh, stretch and uh, rest your eyes, right? Drink some water to refresh yourself, okay? So you can focus better when you come back. Okay, so let's take a look at this poll question here. So you are given the function f of x, right? You are asked to find the f of f of negative x. So to do so, right? So you know, so is negative x is passed to what? To f, right? Then the output number is f of negative x. Then this f of negative x is passed to this machine f again. Then you get what? You get f of f of negative x like that, right? So to work out this problem, you want to evaluate this f at negative x first. So that's the first step here, right? After you get this f at negative x, then you use this as the input, then you evaluate the f at that input. So that's the second step, right? So step one, so what is the f of a negative x? So remember, x is just a placeholder. So two times the input plus three, okay? So now my input is a negative x, so it's two times negative x plus three, which is equal negative two x plus three. So that's the intermediate product, right? He, right here. Then this number, this expression, of course, with, at the end of the day, it's just a number, right? This number is passed to this f again. So now you do, okay, what is the f of f negative x? So it's f of what? f of negative two x plus three, right? You use this as the input. So according to the rule, you multiply the input by two, placeholder, right? So two times negative two x plus three as a whole, right? Then you add three. Then it's a matter of simplification. So it's negative four x plus six plus three so plus nine. So the answer is negative four x plus nine, okay? Now let's uh, move on to function equations. Actually, we already solved a few simple function equations. Let's, talk, let's take a look at some more challenging ones. So for example, so if I tell you a function f of x satisfies this equation here, this is called a function equation. So f of x plus y is equal to x plus f of y for any x and y, okay? And also I tell you f of zero is equal to one. What is the value of f of 2020? So how to do this problem here? So if I know the expression, if I know the expression of fx, then f of 2020 is a matter of evaluation. Simple, right? So however, I don't know the function expression here, right? I just know this equation here. So one way you can try is, can I use this equation to solve for fx, to find an expression for fx, or say to find the letter rule, right? So, or say the mechanism of my machine, right? So very naturally you wanna try what? Because the problem tells you f at zero is equal one, maybe you can try what? Try to plug in y equals to zero, right? I get f zero here, I can use that, right? However, if I do so, then x plus zero is just x. Then immediately I know fx. So f of x plus zero is equal x plus f zero. Then you see well, fx is equal x plus one because f zero is equal one. Then I get what? I get the rule, right? Expression for fx. Then f 2020 is simple, so it's 2021, okay? So this problem here gives you a taste of solving function equations. There are no um, magical recipes, okay? So when you have problems like that, you have to try. So how to try? You try to substitute various values, right? Or expressions for variables in this uh, function equation. So in our case, I tried to substitute y uh, by zero, right? Because I know f of zero is equal one. And if I do so, and x plus zero is just x, right? So that's uh, obvious in this case, okay? So in other problems, you may try always all kinds of uh, combinations, okay? Try to substitute various values or expressions for the variables in the function equation. 
But uh, keep in mind, when you do so, you don't want to do random things, right? You keep in mind what's available, right? So, so with given conditions and needed solutions in mind, all right? You know, I want to find this, and I know this, right? Keep those things in mind when you do these substitutions, okay? So give this problem a try. This is a little bit more challenging here. So can you find the expression for fx, find fx, if fx satisfies this function equation? for all x and y, and also I know f0 is equal one. Can you give this problem a try? So, one and a half a minute. Okay, I think I uh, need some explanation here. I'm not going to share the results. Okay, so how to do this problem here? So the function equation is this one, right? And you want to find the f over x, but what you see in the equation is f over x plus y as a whole and f over x minus y as a whole, right? So how to get the f of x? So remember the general guideline, okay, it's not a, a magic, it's not a, we don't have a magic recipe you can apply it to everything, okay? So you just try, right? Try substitute various values or expressions for variables, right? Keep in mind of uh, the given condition and the, 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 the solution you want to find, okay? So in this case, you know f of zero is equal one, and uh, so one way you can try is, okay, maybe I can substitute, right? Substitute y to be, because this is true for all the x and y, so y can be equal x. So if I let y substitute y equal x into the equation, then I have what? I have f x plus y, y now is x, right? Y can be x, okay? minus f or x minus x. Why am I doing so? Because I know f zero here. So maybe that's a good idea, okay? So you get a f zero equal four x, y is x, four x x. So immediately you get what? f of two x minus f zero is equal one is equal four x squared. So f of two x is equal four x squared plus one. Aha, this equation now is much easier to handle than the original one, right? Basically, it tells you, it tells you what? F of this whole thing here is equal 4x squared plus 1, right? This whole thing is just a multiple of x. So you can easily do a substitution here if you want, right? You can say, oh, that is z equal 2x. So then you have f of z is equal, so then we know x is equal z over 2, right? So it's, what, it's 4 times z over 2 squared, right? x is z over 2. So you get fz. So if you know fz, that means you know fx. So your f of x is equal what? So this will be x squared plus one because this is equal four z squared plus one. Uh, z squared plus one. Okay. 
Or if you want, for this situation here, you can immediately manipulate this guy as what? Because I have two x, we just separate the two x out. So you find out, oh, this is just equal two x square, right? So then you know, oh, f of this guy is equal to square of this guy plus one. So fx is x squared plus one. Okay, so that's uh, the way to do this kind of problem. Okay, so sometimes you want to try y equal x. Sometimes you want to try maybe y equal negative x, and so you just uh, you just uh, try different kind of substitutions. Okay, try to get uh, uh, to your desired uh, solution. Okay, so you, I have some homework problems like that. You can you can try. Okay, so that's the. Topic about um, function evaluations and the function equations. So let's now move on to talk about graphs of functions. So we know a function is like an algebraic uh, uh, concept, right? It's just like a number machine, right? An input, output, a rule. Rule, some normally you see right now is like an algebraic expression, say that 2x plus 3 or x squared minus 1. Right, it's just an algebraic expression involving that input, right, to produce output. So when you say a graph, graph is more about like a geometric uh, concept, right? So how can you make that connection? So what do you mean graphs of functions? So to do so, okay, as we already know, right, a function can be regarded as a relation between two quantities, right, input x and output y, right? So if you put here, right, so this x, is my input and y is my output of this function, right? So for each input, a function assigns an output. So then you can form a pair of real numbers, right? X and y together, you have a pair of real numbers. So when you have a pair of real numbers, what I can do here is now I can form a correspondence between this pair of numbers and the point in a plane. So then that leads to graphs of functions as you will see okay so how to make that connection is how do you make that correspondence between a point in the plane and a pair of real numbers so i think all of you already know right we use what we use a, a cartesian coordinate system okay so this idea was proposed by descartes right a very famous mathematician so it's a very brilliant idea so now you can what? You can study algebra geometrically, you can study geomet uh, geometry algebraically, right? So it's a very nice connection of, of, of different branches of mathematics, okay? So what is a, a Cartesian corner system? So we consider a Cartesian corner system in 2D, okay? So in a plane. So the way you establish this system is very simple. You just put two number lines, one number line horizontally, another number line vertically and they intersect at uh, the point, that point is the, the number zero on both number lines, okay? So that point is called the origin, of course, it's the origin of this number line and the origin of that number line too, right? So when you do so, now you have two number lines, so any point, say this point P, right, in this plane, can now be what? Can be represented by a pair of numbers, and vice versa, any pair of numbers can be assigned uh, with a point in this uh, plane, right? So you have this one-to-one -one correspondence now, okay? So how to do so? So say I have a point P right here, right, in this uh, Cartesian corner system. By the way, the horizontal uh, number line is called the x-axis, right? And the vertical number line is called the y-axis. So now you have a point here, right? So what you can do here is you can what? You can draw a perpendicular line from this point to the two number lines from this point, right? So you project, sometimes we say project this P toward the horizontal guy and toward the vertical number line. So then, of course, you hit this guy right here and right here, right? So you have two numbers, right? One is called X, one is called Y. Then we say these two numbers, X and Y, are the coordinates of this point. So you see now? So this point clearly now is corresponding to two numbers, x and y, which are called the x and the y coordinates of this point. And vice versa, if you give me two number, two values, say one and two, so what I can do here, okay, x equal one, so 
which means so this is a, the projection of that point on this number line. And the y is equal to, so that's a projection on this number line. So of course, when you do projection, you just draw, draw the uh, vertical, uh, draw the uh, perpendicular lines, right? These two perpendicular lines, so they intersect at this point. So that's the point corresponding to this pair of numbers, one and two, right? So vice versa. So if that's the case, then we can introduce the graph of a function. Okay, we know a function is a machine, right? So A number input, B number output. So input output form a pair, right? You have a pair of numbers A and B. Now this pair of numbers can be represented by what? By a point in this uh, Cartesian coordinate system. So if you do, if you mark all these, in, uh, these pairs of numbers, right? You have all these pairs and you connect all these points in the Cartesian coordinate system, you get a curve and that curve is called the graph of the function y equal of fx. Is that clear? So in this case, you clearly see, okay, so suppose this red curve is the graph of this function. So we say, oh, x equal a, what's the other put? So you draw the vertical line toward this curve, you intersect get this point. That point should be a and b. So the b is equal what? b is equal f of a, right? So a is the input, b is the output, which is f of a. So similarly, you can look at other input, output, other input, output, other input, output, like that, right? So you get all these points, right, to form this curve for this function. So that curve is a quadratic graph of the function. Is that clear? So that's a very nice connection because we know sometimes we say a picture says a, a thousand words or more, right? So if you know the picture of something, so you don't need to describe too much, right? You know what's going on by looking at that picture. So similarly for functions. So the graph of a function tells you a lot of information about this function, about its behavior, about its property, okay? So remember, so this function machine, right? We, we, we emphasize this point, right? So it assigns just one output to each input. So graphically speaking, what does that mean? So that means if you supply a number A, so this A here, as the input to this function, so you draw a vertical line and you hit the graph of this function, then you should get a what? You should get just one point. Then you have a, a Y value, which is B as the output. So in this right picture here, I draw a vertical line, right, at X equal A, and it intersects the cur this red curl at two points. That means for this A as the input, I have two different outputs, B1 and B2. Clearly, this curve is not the graph of a function because a function only assigns one output to each input, right? Now you have two outputs, B1, B2. So this test is called a, a vertical line test. So remember this effect here, right? One output assigned to each input. Because of this restriction, then you know what? If you draw a vertical line, that vertical line can intersect the graph of your function only once, okay? At most once, not twice, not for three times, okay? Just once. If uh, that condition is violated, then we know the curve is not the graph of the function. So this is different from the graph of equations. We'll get to that later, okay? We'll talk about a graph of equations, okay? Here we focus on graph of functions. So for functions, we have this vertical line test, but for graph of equations, we don't have such restrictions, okay? You will see that later. Now, so, okay, now we know what a graph of a function is. So you may say, oh, how should I find the, how to I draw that graph, sketch that graph? Okay, a very brutal force approach, right, would be what? Say, again, I take this initial example as uh, the case here. Say I have this function fx equal two x plus three. What's the graph of this function? I think all of you know it's a line, right? It's a line, you already know that. So suppose we don't know that, right? How am I going to sketch? So a very simple way is to establish a table with the pairs of numbers, right? So, okay, I'm going to try different inputs and see what are the outputs. Then you have all these pairs of numbers. If you have these pairs of numbers, then you can mark the points in the Cartesian coordinate plane. Then you can somehow get the idea of 
the graph of this function, right? Because you know a lot of points on the curve, right? So that's what I'm going to do here, right? So say for this function here, at, well, fx equals to 2x plus 3. So x equals negative 2, you compute y is negative 1. Negative 1 is 1, 0, 3, 1, 5, 2, 7, right? So it marks all. Oh, negative 2, x equals negative 2, y is equal what? Negative 1. So it's this point here, and it's this point here, that point, that point, that point. That point. So somehow you connect, you almost get the graph of this function. Looks like a straight line, that's right, okay? But we will explain later why the straight line, okay? So actually this approach is a brutal force approach, right? So it's a kind of a, a time consuming, but that's actually how computers and calculators do, okay? To plot the graph of a function. And later, okay, you will see, we can, we can have some analytical, uh, analytical approach, right? So we don't have to compute a lot of points, we just compute a few points, we try to analyze that algebraic expression, try to find out the feature, or the behavior of the function algebraically, then use that to help us to sketch the graph. So that's a more advanced approach, and we will get to that point later. And even in calculus, okay, in, in, uh, 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 we have uh, uh, curve sketching, okay, as a very important uh, subject, okay, using the derivatives to, to help, okay? Okay, so that's all I was, want to say about the fundamental things of, uh, of functions. Okay, now let's take a look at a very simple and uh, special example, linear functions. Okay, linear functions and the lines. So this topic here, I think, I think all of you already learned in algebra one. So I'm going to uh, go through this part a little bit faster. Okay, but I want to, you guys to have a, a better understanding, okay? Is for example, if I give this equation here, y equal to x plus three, I ask you why this equation gives a line. I say, oh, it's a line. I mean, why you ask that question? But I, I do ask that question. You, you, I want you to convince me why the graph of this equation is, is a straight line, right? So you, can, you, can you answer that question, right? And what's the meaning of a slope, right? Things like that, okay? So of course we know what a linear equation is, right? When we talk about the uh, systems of linear equations before, so this function here, y equals two x plus three. We know this two x plus three is a quite a linear expression. Why? Because the variable is a, it appears with itself multiplied by a number, then you add a constant, right? So it's called a linear expression. So this function is called a linear function. Okay, so let's take a look at this function more closely. Suppose I have two points on a graph of this function. One point is a part of P1, the x coordinate is A. So if x is equal A, y would be what? 2A plus 3, right? Easy. So A can be any number, okay? I don't restrict that. And then I have another point, so it's A plus H. So it just add that A by some H. So you move, so somehow I walk along this number, horizontal number line from A to A plus H, right? I, I walk by, by distance h, okay? So you get a plus h as the input, the other point would be two times a plus h plus three, right? Place holder, right? Now, so what I want to take a look here, this is a very, this is a simple thing, simple stuff, but it's very useful later on when you learn calculus, right? You will see this uh, kind of uh, 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 argument, okay? So, as you move from point P1 to P2, suppose this is the P1 here, this is the P2 here, right? You have to do these two points, two red dots here, right? So what's the change in X? Oh, that's easy. So it's A plus H minus A. That's the change in X. It's just H, a distance is H, right? So I use delta X, okay? This is triangle symbol means delta, okay? So it's just a notation for, for change, delta of X, change in X is H. And what's the corresponding change in Y? Okay, easy, right? So is this Y value subtract that Y value? So it's two times A plus H plus three minus two A plus three. Okay, don't forget the parentheses, right? So if you cancel three, three, then cancel two A, two A, you know it's just two H, right, two H. So then what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the ratio, or say the, the quotient of the change in Y and the change in X, which is that Y over that X. Data y in this example is 2h, data x in this example is h. What do you see here? h, h cancels, right? h is non zero, okay? We are talking about two different points. So you get a 2, which is a constant independent of h. 
okay? So the change in y over change in x is a constant in this case. So what does that mean? So if I, so this is the point P1. So if I move along the horizontal direction by H1, then the change in y would be two of H1, right? The ratio is two. If I use a different H, that ratio is still two, right? So if I move to a different distance by H2, right? I get to H prime point here, then, okay, then the point that I have on the curve on the function would be P2 prime. So what you immediately see here would be what? Because of these two right triangles, and because of the ratio of P2H over P1H is the same as P2 prime, H prime over P1H prime, right? Because these two length ratios are the same for these two triangles. So immediately you know these two right triangles are similar, right? A little bit geometry here, okay? So if they are similar, that means this angle here is the same. So this point P1, P2, and P2 prime, these three points must fall on the terminal side of the same angle, right? It's on a ray. That's the reason the graph of this function is what? It's a straight line. It's not a curve, it's straight. It's always a straight. So because I don't restrict A and, uh, and the H, so that means any two points, any three points should be on a straight line. So that means the whole graph is a straight line. So now you know what? Graph of y equal to x plus three is a line. Now you understand why it's called a line. Why we know this function is called a linear function. Why is a linear function? Because it's a graph, it's a line, right? Linear is like an adjective of this line here, right? And of course, linear functions have very important properties, okay? And actually, later on, you will learn a course, it's called a linear algebra. It deals with the linear functions a lot, okay? So this constant somehow tells you something here, right? This is ratio delta y over delta x is the constant. This constant is the rate of change of y with respect to x, right? So when you, you move in the horizontal direction by, by two, then you, you are elevated in the y direction by what? By four, because that ratio is two, right? So this ratio is called the slope of this line, right? The slope of this line, okay? So it tells you how fast or the line rises or falls, okay? If it's a positive, the line is rising as you move in a positive x direction. If the slope is negative, the line is falling, right? So very quickly, you can look at some forms of, 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 of a line equation, right? So y equal mx plus b. So this form is called a slope in the second form, right? You learned in, in algebra one. So m is the slope, now you understand it, right? Slope is what? is the difference of y over difference of x of two points on the line, right? So y2 minus y, so you have p1 point here, p2 point over there. So p1, so the y coordinates difference of y2 minus y1 over x2 minus over x1. So be careful with the order of these numbers, okay? So, so, it's a, so you see why I use the different colors here, right? y2, x2, and the leading term, then you have y1, x1 after that, right? So in this manner. So this B value is called a Y intercept. Why is it called a Y intercept? Because if you put zero into this equation, so if the input is zero, so what's the Y? Y would be just B. So that means this point here, the coordinates here is zero B, right? It's called a Y intercept, okay? So this is the intercept, intersection of the curve with this Y axis. And very easily you can see two lines, or okay, two different lines, they are parallel if and only if they have the same slope. So in your homework problem, I ask you to prove that, okay? So if two lines have the same slope, they are parallel, and vice versa, if two linear equations have the same slope, then the two lines are parallel, okay? Remember that fact. And if two lines are perpendicular, okay? Two lines are perpendicular, suppose none, none of them is vertical, okay? Then you know what? That's product of the two slopes is equal to negative one. So that's another bonus problem, okay? I want you guys to prove, okay? So those are very important effects I want you guys to, 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 to know. So to give an example, so can you do this uh, poll question here? So I have two points, P and Q, right? I tell you the coordinates. So these two points are on a number on the line L1. So what's the slope of L2? If L2 is perpendicular to L1, can you um, try to do that? 
try this whole question here. Okay, so <clears throat> to find the slope of this line, we know this line is perpendicular to L1, right? So if I know the slope of L1, then I can find the slope of L2 because these two slopes satisfy this relation, M1, M2 equal negative one, the product is negative one. So all you need to do is what? So if this slope is M2, this slope is M1, we know m1 times m2 is equal to negative 1 because the two lines are perpendicular. Okay, so I want to find the m1. So I know two points. We know the slope is defined as the, as the ratio of the y difference and the x difference. So what's the y difference? So you use this value, subtract that value. So it's 2 minus 1. Then use this value, subtract that value, right? Keep the right order, okay? So use q. That is P, okay, so it's one. So of course, this is equal one half. Then what is M2? M2 is equal to negative one over, over M1, right? So it's equal um, negative two, right? Negative two, okay? So that's the way you do this problem here. And by the way, if B is equal zero in that, in that linear function, so your Y is MX, okay? If B is zero, so in this case, we say, uh, this is a direct variation between x and y, or sometimes we say y is proportional to x, right? So m, this slope is called a, a constant of variation, or say constant of proportion, okay? That's a side note here. And of course, there are other forms of a line, right? So I just list them here, right? Say, so y is called a point slope form, right? So if I know one point, and also know the slope, you can write down the equation in this manner. So y minus y1 equal m times x minus x1. Basically, this is just a definition of this uh, slope, right? See, m is equal what? Difference for y over difference over x, right? x and y would be any point on that line, right? Of course, you can get this equation here. So slope, point slope form. Or point point form. Point point form, right? You know one point, then you, so you can plug in, right, into, into the point, point slope form. So then you compute the slope. If you know two points, you can compute the slope in this manner, right? So the difference for y, y2 minus y1, over difference for x, x2 minus x1. That's a slope. So you have a point to point form, okay? And you also have that, this is called an intercept form, right? So the x over a plus y over b equal y. This is a, the intercept form of a line. So clearly you see, if x equal a, then y should be equal to zero, a over a equal y. If uh, y equal b, then x is equal to zero. So you have zero, plus b over b equal one. So a zero, zero b are the two points on the line. So those are the two intercepts, right? So the intersections of that line with the x axis and the y axis, right? B and b here. And uh, this form, ax plus by plus c equals, zero, equals to zero is called the standard form of a line, okay? Standard form of a line. And we do have two special lines. One is a horizontal line. So if the slope is zero, Right, then y is just equal what? m x plus b, m is zero, so just equal b. So y is always equal b. Whatever x as the input, your output is always a constant, right? So this machine is lazy, okay? You give me anything to me, I just give you b, okay? I don't do anything, I just give you the same thing, okay? So that's this lazy machine, this 
is called a constant function. So the function is just the constant fx is always equal b. Does not, does not matter what x values you input uh, to this machine. Okay, so slope is zero. And if uh, you have a vertical line in the Cartesian corner system here, right, like this. So you denote as what as x is always equal a, right? Y can be any value. So in this case, is a, a vertical line is like a cliff, right? So the slope is undefined. Or say the slope is like infinity. Okay, is a, is a cliff, vertical. So this clearly is not a graph of a function, right? Because for this one a as the input, your y can be anything, right? You have infinite many outputs from the, from, from x equal a. So be careful, okay? A vertical line is not a graph of a function, okay? But it's a special line. With that, I'm done with today's lecture and uh, and uh, 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 try to work on your homework problem um, as early as possible, right? So, to, so you can finish on time. And also, um, after uh, Wednesday's recitation, I'm going to post the first exam, okay? According to my schedule, uh, we will have uh, the first exam after four lectures, okay? So, so to keep that in mind, okay? So that's all for today. And uh, if you have any questions, you can stay and ask. ask otherwise, um, I will see you guys on Wednesday. Bye, have a nice week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.